Hello everyone. I am often asked why I praise Soviet electronics, considering it was far from perfect. I love old things, and not just Soviet ones. I enjoy working with them, reminiscing about the past, and it warms my heart. Whether the USSR was good or not is not for me to judge. The truth is, the Union has long since dissolved, but its legacy remains. Today's story is partly about this very legacy. I have a workshop where I spend most of my day. I've long wanted to create a small corner there with old measuring instruments. I collected these instruments over a long time, choosing not just anything, but only what can truly be used in our reality and is reasonably priced. Today, I will tell you about almost all of these instruments. I should note that at various times, I have already made full videos about individual instruments from this lab. So, for those who want more details, you'll find a link to these videos in the description. I'll start, perhaps, with the power sources, as I have a special fondness for them. The cutest and most compact in my collection is the IPS-1. A budget-friendly, simple by Soviet standards, laboratory DC power supply with voltage adjustment from 0 to 15 volts, and current protection. Although it has current limiting, and in the case of short circuits, the power supply voltage will be close to zero, and the current will be limited to 1, 1, and 2 amperes. For small loads, this power supply is just right for people who are starting to study electronics and are looking for a replacement for various batteries. A fairly simple circuit design with a few transistors, reliable construction, and a very attractive design make this power supply quite in demand even today. Considering that they ask for a little on online marketplaces. It is fully linear, with coarse and fine adjustment of the output voltage. On the front panel, in addition to everything else, there is a small analog voltmeter, a power button with a power indicator, and at the bottom, an output for connecting a load. Cooling is natural, with no fans, and it has a power reserve. If you find one for a good price, definitely grab it. A decent little unit that won't take up much space on your desk. Another DC power source is the B547. Very precise and quite stable. It provides an output voltage of up to 30 volts at a current of up to 3 amperes. It is interesting because its converter circuit is a switching type, somewhat reminiscent of a computer power supply. This source is incredibly complex because, firstly, it has a switching converter and, secondly, an unusual control method. Therefore, inside it, among other things, there is a board with a digital-to-analog converter. As expected, there's a lot of precious metal in it. Until recently, I used it actively, but I must say it has at least two drawbacks. I lied, there are actually three. If you set it to zero volts, zero milliamps at the output, there's a high chance that the power inverter will fail. The manual warns about this. Also, the control is not very convenient. The set current and voltage values can sometimes differ from the actual output. Finally, the most noticeable drawback is that its inverter operates at low frequencies within the audible range. Therefore, when in operation, all such power sources emit a whistling sound, which can sometimes be annoying. Otherwise, it's a great power supply. The most advanced power supply in this lab is the Bulgarian T41. It's a current and voltage stabilized power supply, but not a simple one. Firstly, it is completely linear, providing voltage regulation from 0 to 30 volts, at a current from 0 to 5 amperes. Without any modifications, by adjusting a couple of trimmers, it started delivering up to 40 volts at a current up to 7 amperes. Under maximum load, the output voltage ripple is only about 10 millivolts. That is, it is very stable and low noise. It is designed for laboratory research in the most critical areas. This power supply supports a four-wire measurement system to compensate for losses in power cables. Equipped with a three-and-a-half-digit voltmeter, which also functions as an ammeter. If necessary, the voltmeter can be used separately to measure the voltage of external sources. It has a fantastic component base, as well as circuitry. The power unit is built on 5 2 and 30 55 transistors, each on its own separate heatsink. A pair of power transformers, a bunch of capacitors for power supply, and selected components with gold plating. 
The most interesting thing is that it has a relay switch, which, if necessary, will connect the second transformer in series with the first. That is, the source has quite a high efficiency. Very precise, with remarkably high stability for its age. Either way, it's from 1989, manufactured in Bulgaria. As for the drawbacks, I would only note its large size and weight of 18 kilograms. This thing with the abbreviation IPR is also a power source, but it's intended for slightly different tasks. It's part of my galvanic isolation system. Another part is on the first table next to my main equipment. In general, in fact, this box is nothing more than we supply to input 40, 50 volts AC. And at the output, we can get either DC or AC with voltage regulation from 0 to 50 volts at a maximum current of 8 to 10 amps according to the specifications, but in reality, up to 15 to 20 amps. It has two large analog indicators for current and voltage, power terminals, and a large knob for adjusting the voltage. A toggle switch changes the outputs, DC or AC. So, I can make AC at its output, then feed this AC to the primary winding of some transformer, which also has a winding for 220 or 380 volts, and ultimately get a galvanically isolated voltage from the network with adjustment from 0 to 220 volts and above. In this way, you can completely ensure your safety during everyday experiments. That is, the test load is powered, not from the network, but from this system. Multimeters, how could we do without them? I'll say right away that I have many analog multimeters and they have certain advantages, but they are bulky and the readings from them are not as instantaneous as with digital devices. But I also have a digital multimeter produced in the USSR. In fact, I have two. It's the Electronica MMC-01, which cost in the mid-1980s a lot of money, a whole average monthly salary. The electronics have an unusual method of control instead of the standard four modern multimeters switch. Here it is, so, to speak, button-based, and the measurement mode is selected by a specific combination of these buttons. But you get used to it quite quickly. It's a fairly accurate device. Built on the ADC KR572 PV5, which is an analog of the ICL7106. Such an ADC is still used today in both budget modern multimeters and in mid-range multimeters. The multimeter measures almost everything, except for frequency, capacitance, duty cycle, and there's no continuity test either. But still, it supports the main measurements. The display is liquid crystal, three and a half digits. Consider it a good DT830. But it measures resistance not up to 2 megohms, but up to 20. Additionally, it can also measure AC current. The 830 can't boast about that, can't. These multimeters are, of course, good, but when it comes to precise measurements and stability, they are, of course, not at that level. For these purposes, a Soviet digital benchtop voltmeter V7-38 was acquired. This device can measure AC and DC voltage, current, and resistance. It's quite a serious and precise instrument with four and a half digits, with fully automatic range selection, and most importantly, it can measure high-frequency AC voltage up to 100 kHz. The main characteristics are as follows, DC and AC voltage from 10 microvolts to 1000 volts. The average error for DC voltage is 0.04, 0.07. In the case of AC, based on frequency, the average error ranges from 0.4 to 1.5. Resistance up to 20 megaohms. Error is 0.05, 0.07. DC current is 0, 0.02, ACE 1, and 6. The device weighs 2 kilograms. It has a fairly budget-friendly casing, but extremely cool electroluminescent indicators. Three buttons for selecting the main measured quantities and input terminals. Within certain measurement ranges, it is quite accurate and can compete with expensive multimeters. Inside, it is also assembled economically. The microchips are in plastic casings, mostly operational amplifiers, logic counters, and decoders. There are almost no electrolytic capacitors, except for the power supply units. I will talk more about the internals in a separate video about this voltmeter. 
Initially, it was a bit inaccurate, with DC voltage, but having a reference. Instrument of higher accuracy on hand, the V7-38 was calibrated. Now it works, like a Swiss watch. Then there were long tests to check the stability of readings in different temperature ranges. And I can say that, a fairly accurate instrument has appeared in my lab, which in many cases can be used as a reference. An oscilloscope is an integral part of any workshop. Of course, we are used to digital instruments, but analog ones still rule in many aspects. Take, for example, the fact that they don't need to spend time digitizing the input signal. We see it in its original form without any delays. Digital needs time to construct this signal. And then there's the digitization speed. This is to say that on an analog instrument, a signal is more natural. Of course, there are digital oscilloscopes with insane digitization speeds for the input signal, but those cost a ton of money. I had several analog oscilloscopes, but I sold them off, keeping only the C1-73 because it's quite accurate and, importantly, compact. It's a single-channel analog oscilloscope with a bandwidth of 5 MHz. Not much, but I assure you, for my pulse tasks, it's more than enough. In any workshop, there's a modern soldering iron or station. I have those too. But I also have this ancient yet professional soldering station, the Termit PM3670. Many remember Soviet soldering irons like these. But the Soviets had modern soldering irons for those times, not just any kind. But with thermal stabilization, this particular model is indeed a representative of the highest class of soldering equipment in the USSR. Despite its compact size, the soldering iron has an impressive power of 70 watts, and it's also highly precise. A compact station with a separate temperature control unit. And yes, the tips are interchangeable to suit any preference. Thanks to the beveled shape of the opposite tip, a larger contact area is ensured, providing efficient heat transfer from the heater to the tip. The station is low voltage, powered by 30. 6 to 40 volts and it has a temperature sensor. Control is simple but quite clever, implemented on a triac. It solders well. Working with such a soldering iron is a pleasure. Of course, by today's standards, this principle is outdated because the thermal stabilization here doesn't react as quickly as, for example, in those stations with T12 tips or more advanced ones. But by those standards, it was truly cool. A signal generator is a device that is not used as frequently as all the others, but in many cases, you can't do without it. Here, I want to express my immense gratitude to my viewer Nikolai for the wonderful gift of a not-so-cheap in our day's G5-63 generator. It's a very robust, reliable, professional signal generator with the capability of forming single and paired high-amplitude pulses. Weighing in at 7.5 kilograms. The capabilities of this generator might seem amusing to many, but don't rush to conclusions. It comes with a bunch of connecting wires, as well as two UPA units, amplitude enhancement devices, and a divider. Unlike budget Chinese generators, this model can produce rectangular pulses with an amplitude of up to 60 volts, and with the amplifier, this amplitude can actually reach up to 150, 180 volts. Of course, this is for a specific load, according to the specifications, 1, 5 kilo ohms. But, believe me, it has such a powerful output that it can light up network bulbs. This is to say that after preliminary tests, I concluded that its specifications are very modest compared to its actual capabilities. The duration of the pulses ranges from 1,000th to 1,000 microseconds, inside and outside as well. The device is assembled according to all the standards of military technology. It's clear that it wasn't stored in the best conditions, there is some corrosion, but the boards with components are like new, reinforced mounting, strengthened chassis, a lot of aluminum and iron. The transformer is fully protected from dust and moisture. Large capacitors of the KM series, a large amount of palladium and platinum, silver contacts, gold transistors, mica tubular capacitors. In general, everything used here is the best and most select that was available in the USSR. This is precisely why the device is fully operational after so many years. Of course, the lacquer on the boards also plays a role in this. 
and they didn't skimp on it here either. The front panel of the device has many different switches and knobs. I admit that without an oscilloscope, preferably a digital one, working with such a generator is not an easy task. It's not like in modern, digital ones, where you set the desired frequency with buttons and that's it. Here, a calculator is needed, preferably from the same era. This equipment forgives many mistakes due to its reliability. It's clear that it was created without skimping, and not with the aim of ensuring large sales, but with the goal of creating long-lasting and reliable equipment. It is quite outdated these days, I understand. But that doesn't mean it's bad. Frequency is still measured in hertz, and voltage in volts. The question is whether you want to work with it, and how quickly you'll get used to the controls. In other respects, this old timer is still quite something. Many of my videos are created not in one week or even one month. While I was filming this video, one of the viewers, Mikhail, wrote to me and offered to give me as a gift completely free of charge this marvel of Soviet technology. The RV7-32 voltmeter. This voltmeter is very interesting and also deserves a separate review if it weren't for one, but... Unfortunately, an incident occurred, and I'm terribly upset about what happened. The thing is, while I was filming this video for a couple of days, the voltmeter was on my table, connected to the power supply. There is a toggle switch at the back to turn it off, but it wasn't for the power, and the transformer remained connected to the power supply. As a result, it was plugged in for a couple of days, and during filming, I noticed that the device's casing was hot, and it didn't respond to that switch. Upon opening it, I was disappointed. The filled transformer changed color, the stabilizer transistor burned out, and the tantalum capacitor leaked. Initially, when I received it, I opened it, and the situation was completely different. The voltmeter was in a zero state internally. This is my mistake for not studying it properly before putting it into operation. I will definitely restore it soon, and I hope the transformer is intact, but even if it is burned out, the voltmeter will be restored, and it's, you could say, a matter of principle. It's frustrating and awkward in front of the audience. Besides, this voltmeter has increased accuracy of 0.01% in almost all ranges of DC voltage measurement, and it measures up to 1 kilovolt. The coolest thing is that it can measure AC with a frequency up to 100 kilohertz. It can also measure resistance with an accuracy of 0.2, 0.3%, and both AC and DC current. It also has auto range selection, but for each measured quantity, there is a separate input. It might seem that this voltmeter is of a consumer grade level, but believe me, that's far from the case. Unlike the first benchtop voltmeter, which mostly uses standard components inside, here we see an assembly entirely made with military grade components. Everything is assembled lavishly, gold, palladium, platinum, and silver. A paradise for a refiner, in a word. It consists of two boards. The board with the digital part lacks shielding and special protections. The other board is housed in a sealed metal case. An abundant amount of lacquer. Everything is coated with precious metals. In general, a vivid example of how the Soviets assembled electronics for critical tasks. Most of the devices shown initially did not require maintenance, as they came to me, you could say, from storage and in perfect condition. Others, over time, will be serviced. These are truly workhorses that can still be used today. Yes, modern laboratory equipment may be more compact, lightweight, and cheaper, but that doesn't necessarily mean they will be better than these old timers. For example, the 41st TS. Out of all my lab equipment, it's the quietest. And I have about 10 labs, including professional precision sources costing hundreds of dollars. Today's video turned out to be long, but I hope you enjoyed it, and many were able to reminisce with me. Well, this video is coming to an end. Rate it. Share it with friends, and as always, you'll find other useful information in the description. As always, this was Kazyanov Ka with you, and until next time. Bye! Well, a small addition at the very end. I apologize for my voice, I caught a cold. This voltmeter has been repaired and is working properly. The capacitor, which turned out to be niobium, short-circuited. As a result, the stabilizer key heated up and the transformer overheated. 
Fortunately, the latter did not burn out. Why the capacitor failed, I don't know.